Um, well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, it's funny to um, think about me watching uh, Dino Fest on YouTube uh, last year, and now I'm actually kind of an honorary inductee into the track pack. So I really uh, appreciate that. Um, like so many uh, of us um, who presented today, um, I just want to kind of uh, highlight a theme that I found that uh, diversity of approaches, diversity of flora and fauna abound in these talks. And, but one thing that I, I would like to touch on a little bit more is the diversity of the personalities of the people in the 19th century that really got um, ecology and paleontology moving forward from the Connecticut Valley and obviously expanding westward. Um, and one of those individuals um, who was not Edward Hitchcock or Dexter Marsh or, uh, or Dean was um, this individual named uh, Joseph Barrett. Uh, he was a very eccentric person. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about his life and legacy uh, in the Connecticut River Valley and perhaps um, ironically, uh, what he is more uh, known for is his death and his unique ecological uh, tombstone. I'm going to try to keep this to 15 minutes, and then I'm also going to just show a few uh, tracks that I have in my collection. So like everyone else, I, I, um, I've been obsessed with uh, dinosaurs since the tender age of two, and for better or worse, I haven't been able to get away from paleontology, and I've also had some uh, luck uh, with it keeping me into it. And, being relevant even though I'm an archeologist. Um, so Joseph Barrett was born uh, in 1796 and he lived until 1882. And uh, he was English born and his primary uh, vocation was uh, medicine. Uh, hold on, the uh, dialogue is moving away. Um, uh, his primary vocation was medicine and actually what brought him to Connecticut was a, um, uh, a, an academy called Partridge Academy that was based in Norwich, Vermont. Uh, relocating to Middletown. So his entry into this area of the Connecticut River Valley was actually um, just fateful that the academy where he worked at uh, moved to Middletown. And he is known as a polymath. He had many wide-ranging interests, uh, botany, geology, ornithology, entomology, chemistry, mineralogy, meteorology, the local um, history, natural history, uh, paleontology, and even Native American ethnology and linguistics. And he published on uh, I know for sure botany, uh, uh, Native American ethnology and linguistics, and later in life geology with some pretty um, odd ideas. Uh, he was described as a man with great energy and ambition, but lacking focus to see any project to completion, which I think for people with wide ranging interests, we can all uh, sort of relate to, but he did it on a level that um, is sort of unsurmounted. Uh, but uh, what, what uh, Barrett is actually, um, his real contribution, ironically, was to uh, uh, botany. Uh, he helped to establish the uh, Cuvarian Society at Wesleyan uh, and taught some of the earliest botany courses there in 1835. And he actually amassed an impressive herbarium collection uh, that still remains at Wesleyan, although more of it was present there um, back in the um, uh, 20, or mid 20th century. And um, sorry, I'm trying to get this out of the way. My dialogue box is obscuring what I can see. Sorry about that. Um, and so actually what he, um, uh, he was named, uh, his name uh, is present on this uh, species of willow, Barrett's willow, Salix uh, uh, Baratiana. Um, and he uh, befriended uh, Asa Gray and John Torrey. Uh, and John Torrey actually on the left there, he was very close friends. He nursed John Torrey out of a, a very serious medical uh, condition and that sort of solidified their bond. And then uh, Tory introduced him to Asa Gray, who was a prolific 19th century botanist. And he actually named that um, species of willow there uh, after Barrett. And I believe the range of this is out in Alaska and areas of Montana. And so um, as he as he got older, he became very preoccupied with ecology. And this is commensurate with the move of the scientific community toward uh, looking at uh, trace fossils in the mid 19th century uh, with, with Hitchcock um, you know, publishing his famous uh, Ecnology of New England in 1858. And so he developed a strong fascination that would, wrap, would last the rest of his uh, life really until he died. Um, and what, what 
Barrett is really known for amongst, uh, other than his tombstone, which I'll get to, is that he was uh, prolific at acquiring some really special, spectacular pieces for Hitchcock's cabinet. Uh, he collected several, um, what you call arcosic sandstone, brownstone track specimens uh, from the quarry where he, um, uh, nearby quarries where he lived in Portland and uh, Middletown, Connecticut. This is a picture of what the quarry uh, would have looked like in the 1870s. You can see that uh, flooding was a common uh, event. And actually, if you go and collect at any quarries where you're allowed to, uh, today, waterworks are always a feature. There's always a pool of water. And if you go there when it's raining or had recently rained, you know, you'll see a downpour of water. Um, so this is what it looked like in the 1870s. This is off after Barrett's time, but this is the earliest picture I was able to get. Um, but this is what it looks like today. Um, you can actually see this um, uh, just passing by um, Portland, Connecticut. This is the Portland Quarry. And as you can see, it's heavily flooded. Um, it's made access to any uh, stones pretty difficult. Um, there are still some active uh, quarry uh, operations, or there were, but you can still see, for instance, on the walls, um, people inscribe dates. Uh, and, you know, because they were um, uh, quarrying from the top down, it's kind of weird to see the, the, the level at which the quarry once was because um, obviously they're, they're going from top to bottom. But the quarry flooded due to hurricanes uh, in, I think, 1932 is when it really um, got permit to flood. Uh, so among his contributions, uh, 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 Hitchcock actually named uh, this, um, this critter after him, uh, Chimera uh, baratai, baratai. Uh, I believe it is an Anamipus uh, species now, or it might even be a crocodilomorph. I'm not sure what it's considered um, today, but uh, here Hitchcock talks about his friendship with him. I affix the name of my friend, Dr. Joseph Barrett of Middletown to the species as its discoverer, although I'm not sure that the specimen, uh, which he pointed out to me in Middletown as the anime, as Anamipus baratai is the same. So they're uh, kind of contesting the identity there. Um, but the, the really uh, spectacular piece that uh, Barrett contributed to the ichnological cabinet is uh, this one. Um, Hitchcock called it the gem of his collection. It's the catalog number 914 uh, of the Beneski Museum. And it's prominently featured there in, a, uh, I believe, a nice old oak frame. Um, this was originally a, a paving stone in Middletown. Um, and it was a paving stone for some 60 years before um, Barrett uh, discovered it and eventually sold it to Hitchcock. Um, at the left is the, uh, the plate from Hitchcock's Ichnology of New England, and the right is a picture that I took. But what's unique about this slab is how many tracks there are, and also you have digits one through four uh, really nicely represented, which of course sort of unlocks the avian connection, right, with the number of bones in the, in the foot. But this is um, uh, also possibly the oldest uh, track fossil uh, ever found with respect to you know, Western record um, because it was discovered uh, as such in the 1830s or 40s and it was a paving stone for 60 years. So uh, it, it may have been maybe the oldest, but um, the Navajo actually out in, if you go to Tuba City in Utah, uh, there are plenty of uh, large Brontes tracks and uh, Ancestral Pueblo people and Navajo both have um, lots of oral histories talking about um, these types of tracks and what they, what they may have been. And so as, as Barrett got older, his um, eccentric theories um, really marked his uh, mental decline. Uh, he put forth ideas that some of the tracks uh, that he was seeing were homo tetradactylus, which were four-toed human beings. Um, and he also claimed that he saw um, bones in the Connecticut sandstone at Portland of oxen and other animals that would have been used by these ancient humans. Um, he also um, decided that the age of the sandstone was actually younger, placing it into the Eocene, which is uh, you know, 50 million years or so. And so he was later committed to an insane asylum in 1880 um, by, by his friends. But one thing I wanted to kind of perhaps redeem Barrett in a way is that um, he, um, oh, uh, were you saying something, Sarah? Sarah, okay. <laughs> um, one thing that I wanted to sort of um, perhaps redeem Barrett's ideas is that 
you know, when you when you start spouting crazy things, even if you're seeing evidence of something and interpreting it wrong, it doesn't mean that the evidence isn't real. Um, and one thing that uh, Hitchcock uh, talks about in Technology of New England is that um, there are perhaps bones that were present in the Portland um, area, uh, preserved, I think, as Patrick uh, Getty talked earlier about, as, as molds. And Hitchcock here uh, says, yet I confess that one or two specimens pointed out to me by Dr. Barrett seems so closely to imitate a group of large vertebrae as to deserve attention. And this, um, this is a bit of a long um, uh, section here, but uh, basically in it, uh, Hitchcock is outlining the conditions that would likely result uh, in the, in the, he is quite right in predicting that the petrifaction of these bones, the conditions would have to be quite um, ideal. Uh, and at this time, there was no kind of clear evidence that this type of preservation occurred at all. Mark? Yes. I'm having a little technical trouble at my end. So if, I'm having trouble with the transmission. Okay. But excuse me for interrupting, but I would love to see your 3D. We're running out of time and we, oh, we, can, sure. run a we can run a little late today. But I do want to make sure you get to that 3D model. Yes, yes. I, I only have uh, pictures of the model, actually, because it's being okay. shipped to me. So I can advance to those um, okay. real quick. Um, but um, anyway, I, um, I wanted to talk about the bone preservation in the context of Barrett, just because uh, in 1865, after Hitchcock's death, um, William Barton Rogers, who actually went on to found MIT, discovered um, uh, these bone casts. and um, uh, I also um, most recently uh, discovered um, a, a probable bone cast with uh, dinosaur tracks on the same substrate layer. And um, me and some colleagues, Patrick Getty, Peter Letourneau, Spencer Lucas, will be um, writing this up. And this will eventually go on display in the Bruce Museum by 2022. So you can all um, enjoy it. It's a, it's a unique slab. Um, it might actually be the only slab with a bone cast and tracks on it. So we're excited about it um, and what it what it might mean for future discoveries. And there's an example of, of a track up, up close. And so getting to the uh, tombstone, uh, when Barrett died, um, this individual, Mr. Charles Browning, who it's sort of unclear uh, of his affiliation with Barrett, but he was a secretary in Middletown, presumably a friend. And he suggested that an ideal tombstone would be something with tracks on it. Um, and here is Barrett's tombstone at Indian, uh, uh, Indian Hills Cemetery in Middletown. Um, on the back side of it is a is it's hard to read in this, um, but I can advance to this uh, image of the model that I've created. And on the back of it, it says the testimony of the rocks. And this is a direct reference to Hugh Miller's um, uh, work, Testimony of the Rocks. And sadly, and perhaps in a um, uh, a strange relation, Hugh Miller went uh, had psychotic depression, I believe, and he actually as he was reviewing the final proofs of this volume he uh, committed suicide uh, for fear of hurting uh, people close to him is what I've read and it, it's sort of weird parallel to Barrett going insane uh, perhaps the inscription of this on his tomb is a reference not only to that but also to Miller's efforts to keep uh, his Christian beliefs uh, close to you know his scientific observations uh, of course Hitchcock did this uh, as well Here's the backside. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the inscription here. Here are two large um, fossil log casts. And here on the, on the opposite side of the face side with the inscription are um, many, many brontozoid and gray litter tracks. You can see two here. This may even be a, a metatarsis, but I, I couldn't be, be sure. There's a lot of overlap with um, the tracks crisscrossing. And here's the 3D model that I, um, I created with a uh, colleague of mine, Nathan Williams, who's a professional uh, photographer. Um, he's gotten beautiful pictures of caves in National Geographic, and he does really good uh, 3D modeling work, and we collaborated on this. And so you can see the front here very clearly, and I, I think what's great about it is it really shows the tracks on the back of the 3D model and creates a very nice uh, uh, positive uh, contrast here. And the last thing I want to say is what we're, what we're trying to do now, me and some colleagues are, to um, secure some small grants from the CT Humanities um, funds to actually uh, restore the face side because 
you know, the bedding plane on brownstones, they, they often crumble and there's some, you know, spalling here due to the environmental uh, uh, conditions of, of New England. And also as a way to preserve the monument in, in three dimensions, because you have an interesting, uh, you know, stuff on the front and back. Uh, I had a 3D uh, model made, painted to look like uh, the sandstone. Um, and again, this is going to be useful in the restoration effort because you can see the areas that are, that are uh, very clearly missing. And there's the back with um, the tracks. And so uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Sarah, Paul Olson, Peter Letourneau, Patrick Getty, um, Nick McDonald, and Fred Venn. Everyone here has played some kind of role in my entry into the roadshow or my entry into this uh, fascinating field of, of science. So thank you.